over the phone. But he's 6'5 now. Okay, so if you look back in Farscape episodes, uh, season two, there's this little tiny baby, uh, you know, uh, not even a baby, but he was a toddler that said, goes, hi, dad. Um, in uh, the Look at the Princess trilogy, those two kids were my actual kids. So the little tiny one there, little cute toe-headed thing, he's no longer toe-headed, he's 6'5", dark, football-playing monster. <laughs> was out past his curfew, so I had to kick his ass over the phone. But anyway, what, what, this is what I'm gonna, because I'm gonna go really long, this is why I don't do Twitter, right? <laughs> I, can't, I can't say anything really in a, in a short fashion, you know, nothing, you know, 140 characters, I, I haven't even got past hello. <laughs> I'm like, like one of those alien species, uh, no, I'm like an ent, that's what I am, I'm an ent. But it got me, uh, so anyways, I was up and I was thinking, so I started reading my book, right? And I'm reading Bill Bryson's, um, I always like to bring a book to introduce to people because I'm a big believer in reading. Read young, keep reading, read through your life. I'm reading, yeah. I'm reading Bill Bryson's uh, Made in America. Anybody read it? Anybody? Highly recommend it, particularly you. Of course Angie's read it. Isn't it awesome? Okay, so, so I'm reading the book and I'm at the very beginning of it and it, it's, talking, it's about language, it's about uh, the changes in language and how it intersects with history and the meanings of things and words on things and what things mean and I started thinking about it and realized that in general within the sci-fi community there is a hidden language. You guys all understand the same kind of language, which is maybe why you gather together in these places, because you understand one another. <laughs> and your friends and family don't. <laughs> but it also, it transcends into the larger culture. Like, if we talk about uh, the dark side, everybody knows that's a sci-fi reference, but we, we know, if we talk about my precious, right? <laughs> like, my precious, you know, even, even 10 years ago, if you call someone my precious, they're not going to look at you like, what? Like, if I call my wife my precious now, she knows that she's actually a dark, evil force. <laughs> it's actually become more accurate over time. Uh, but it did, it got me, it got me thinking about this and, and, you know, the legacy of sci-fi. And then you start thinking about, so what's Farscape's legacy going to be, man? What's it, what's it going to be? Crichtonisms. Right? That's the one that I want to slip into the mainstream culture, like Malaprop. You know? I'm sure it was named after somebody. Like, America. Like, where did the name America come from? Right? Exactly. So, here's a dude who's a merchant. It's a, there's a merchant that is on board a ship that's sailing around the Americas. The dude does nothing. He's a passenger on a ship, right? 50 years after he dies, they write a story. They, they, they write a story about him, which then a guy who's making a map is looking for a reference because they're calling it something else, and he goes, and the name is America, so it becomes America. And now we wake up hundreds of years later and we say America, and it evokes all of these amazing things, right? I'm sure Michael Crichton is rolling over, you know, you know, he's, he's mad about it right now that I want Crichtonism to be the thing. <laughs> But that a Crichtonism is something that you say to someone else, they don't understand what it is you're talking about. It could be funny, it could be poignant, but they don't understand. And I realize that many of us walk out into the world and we say things and we're talking, you know, it's not gonna be the dark side, but it might be, oh yeah, for all you, you know? And only a specific number of people are gonna understand or no one is going to understand us. I come here to be understood. <laughs> I'm just here looking for a little understanding. But this is, it, you know, this is what occurred to me at four o'clock in the morning, which is of course why I don't write a lot of scripts, because no one understands them. Uh, but I have to say that, that one of the great things that, that I get from this, and, and hopefully you guys get it as well, and you get it more with one another than you'll get it with the guests, you know? I mean, the, the guests of these things, euphemistic guests, I'm a guest. Uh, that, that, you know, some of them will absolutely understand what you're talking about. They'll understand the questions that you're asking. They'll understand your references. But I loved that about Crichton. I loved it about Crichton that Crichton was quite literally one of us. You know, he's one of, he's one of us. <laughs> you know, he, he literally is, you know, 
probably wearing a, a, a t-shirt with a comic book thing on it. My daughter gave me this. And, and my daughter also gave me uh, you know, the, the Bryson. She's an English major and she's smarter than me. And she's a girl, so obviously smarter than me to begin with. <laughs> But I, 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 I love that about this, and I love that about John Crichton, that, you know, he was saying all these things that we think. He was, he was going, you know, he was, like, literally, I mean, think about, you know, like this, you know? We all know what that means, right? Live long and prosper. In fact, the general population knows what that means. But there was a period of time where nobody knew what that meant, right? And there was a period of time where nobody in this room knew, would know what a Crichtonism is. And at this point, probably a few of you know what a Crichtonism is. And probably exercise that on a daily basis and people look at you like you're nuts. <laughs> and I sort of feel like with Farscape, as a, you know, looking back at it, that the Crichtonisms, which I didn't invent, by the way. I made up a few as we went along, but that Rock O'Bannon and David Kemper and, and myself and Ricky Manning and other people and the directors came up with these Crichtonisms, that they were a geek community and they were writing for us. And, I'm, and I'm, so I'm really happy to be here how many years later talking about Crichtonisms and talking about America, an American, and realizing that in 300 years there'll be, you know, the capital of Crichton, the country. <laughs> no one will know, you know why, or it'll be Browder, and no one will know, and no one will, no one will know that I didn't do anything. <laughs> But the, it, it's, you know, it's that amazing thing about this journey of humanity and language and stories that we tell, that the stories become more important than, the stories are more important than the truth. The truth of Thanksgiving, I was reading about that. The truth about Thanksgiving is so far from what we're taught in schools, you know, that to the degree that it doesn't matter what the reality is, that the story will endure. So 300 years from now, they're going to know who Luke, and, and they're going to know about the Force, and they're going to know about live long and prosper, and they're going to know that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, not because someone else said it first, but because Spock said it, and what a cool thing it is to, to, to be here and to share this kind of stuff. That's my monologue. That's what happens at 3.30 in the morning when your son stays out too late. Thank you for coming to Phoenix. So normally at this point in the uh, in the experience, we start taking questions. Do we have a mic for people to take questions? We don't even need a mic. No, it's, we've been doing pretty good without one. We're, yeah, but mics are fun. <laughs> when you get desperate, like when you're standing in front of a group of people, see, this is my protection, but then they, you can play with them. And John Berriman would be doing other things. <laughs> for those of you who saw John Berriman here last year, yes. never stay in a hotel room next to John Berriman. <laughs> I've told that story, I'm sure some of you have heard it, but, you know, I won't retell it unless forced. Okay, so you met John, he's a really nice guy. Yes. He's into an alternative lifestyle. Yes. He's gay. Yes. Probably so. I was at a convention in Germany. And this is the great thing about John Berriman, he won't mind me telling these stories because he's the most shameless person I've ever met. <laughs> An okay kisser. <laughs> no one here good as other people, but uh, <laughs> yes, I have kissed John Barrowman. <laughs> I know. And, and here's the thing, like, you know, I, I coach high school kids. Um, I, and I coach you to I coach you to Christian high school. <laughs> and I have to be careful because, you know, the internet being what it is, by the time I by the time I hit the, the pavement back in in California, they'll be, oh coach, no. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> Yeah, that one happened. I was in Germany. By the time I got back to coach these kids, they're like, Coach, no. <laughs> Either that or my wife, she Googles me, and she goes, oh, honey, no. <laughs> my precious. <laughs> so I'm staying in a hotel. John Berriman's in the room next door. Now, the hotel is, is, uh, is right near the airport, but it, there's, there's two banks on the hotel. So there's, there's this bank and this bank, and they look at one another. There's a middle courtyard and an atrium, and below is glass and everything, so you look down and you realize that Germans don't actually sleep when they go to cons. This is crazy. I didn't know Germans partied that much, but literally there were people all night long. In fact, a lot of them, I don't think, had rooms. They were sitting, sleeping, drunk down below. <laughs> but I divert. <laughs> I digressed. Um, Barrowman's next door, right? 
So about, this is, a, and this is why I go, when I go to a con, it's like, I got a full day, I'm gonna meet people, I wanna sleep, right? Just like last night, I wanted to sleep. So I can be compass mentis the following day. About two o'clock in the morning, I start hearing a thumping. I'm like, oh no, barrel in the door. So there's two, two banks in this, right? So there's no way for me to know what's going on next door other than through the sounds on the wall. And um, I'm hearing what sounds like some sort of Celtic ritual. <laughs> And there's a thumping, 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 you know, rhythmic thumping. I'm like, oh no, my imagination is that. And I'm thinking, this can't be what I think is going on. No, please no. <laughs> because of the two banks in the hotel as we get back to, there's glass, glass windows, right? And it's nighttime. So there's reflections, right? I've got my, I've got my curtains drawn, right? But it's going on, it's gotten loud enough. I'm like, man, what in the world's going on? Maybe this window opens, I can like look next door and go, Barrowman, whatever it is, cut it out, right? <laughs> I open my shades and there's a massive reflection like a mirror and I see directly back into the room next to me and the curtains are open. <laughs> the light is on. There is John Barrowman, naked. <laughs> there's another person naked and they are dancing <laughs> so I, you know I'm going oh no no there's two naked men and, and then the Celtic ritual continues <laughs> well I probably shouldn't say who was with him naked he's already said it oh yeah it was his co-star it was his this female co-star, <laughs> yeah, from Torchwood, and they were dancing around the room for hours naked. <laughs> now, I only got the reflection, but every German on the other side <laughs> got the full view of Barrowman. I guess the moral of that story is be careful what you do at conventions because you never know who's watching. If I see John the next day, right? And I'm thinking, oh, okay, he's going to be really embarrassed about this. Oh, no. No, 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 he was fine with it, he was cool with it. Which of course is why he tried to copulate with me on stage <laughs> in, in Germany, Dusseldorf. That wasn't me, that was a story about someone else. Michael Shanks did that. <laughs> That's the Barrowman story. Uh, any, any questions? Great, let's go get drinks. <laughs> Yes, whatever, just stand up, yes. So uh, how did the whole transfer from you and Claudia Black go to SG-1 happen? I mean... Large sums of money. <laughs> Large sums of money, yeah. You were going, but the miracle of both of you going was... Claudia had done the show. She'd already done an episode with Michael Shanks and had reported that she had a great time. And I ran into Michael on a plane uh, on my way to, to Vancouver. That's my That's wife calling. <laughs> Man, turn off your phones when you come in these places. Actually, someday I'm just going to just we're going to have an internet conversation instead of, uh, <laughs> instead of talking. I'm just, we're still going to get our phones. We're going to tweet one another. Um, so yeah, so I had met Mike and and uh, you know and he had spoken highly of it. I liked Mike and then I met. So Claudia had already done the show and they loved Claudia as you would. And then I met the executive producer. Um, Brad Wright at a sci-fi event and this is, this is how for those of you who haven't heard the story this is how I got the job on Stargate SG-1 I uh, we were at a sci-fi party right and uh, I meet Brad Wright never met him don't know much about SG-1 but you know I knew the show I've seen the movie I've seen a couple episodes I knew they were competition but Farscape, Farscape was in between the minutes so anyway I met Brad and we're, we're talking and um Trisha Helfer, yeah, from Battlestar Galactica, is about, you know, 40, 40 feet away in the party. It's a big party, lots of famous sci-fi people wandering around, but Trisha's over there and she's in this little strapless number. <laughs> and, you know, Trisha's an attractive girl, right? And Brad Wright is, keeps turning and looking at Trisha. Oh, man, that's just not fair. It's just not fair. <laughs> and, I, and I go, who are you looking at? He goes, that one. 
And I look over and I see it's Trisha Helfer, right? And he goes, man, that's just, ah. Uh. And I go, you know you're talking about my wife. <laughs> he goes, what? He goes, that's my wife. Trisha's not my wife. <laughs> Francesca is my wife. <laughs> he goes, oh man, I am so sorry. I, I am so sorry. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't know. I, he, I, and, 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 and he goes, oh, wait. Well, you're, you're effing with me, right? <laughs> and he looks at Dan and I, and I just turn, and I turn to Trisha, and I go, Hey, Trish, you're my wife? She turns around and goes, Hell yeah, I'm your wife! <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, man. I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. I go, oh, man, she played my wife in a TV show. I'm just effing with you. That's how I got on Stargate. <laughs> yeah. Claudia did it with talent. I did it with Trisha Helfer. <laughs> the English language is so imprecise. You hear how I just did that? Yeah. Love, the language, love the English language. In fact, I just got, oh, I got a text from, from my, um, my, my, my college applicant who stayed out last night. He's talking about, I'm writing a college essay. I'll send you for, I just want you to, to take a look at it after I flush it out. <laughs> uh, Autocorrect on that, I think you meant flesh it out. <laughs> but flesh it out is probably more appropriate <laughs> for a college essay. <laughs> Love the English language. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I forgot to bring my iPad. Oh, I have a picture of what I did on my uh, my birthday. I can't tell you anything about it. I, Hollywood has gone nuts. I have to. I literally have to sign on a number of. You have to sign an NDA, non-disclosure agreement, to audition for stuff. I literally I have auditioned for things that you have to sign an NDA on, but I'm working on something that I have an NDA non-disclosure agreement, so literally I can't talk about it. I have a photo, but I didn't bring it with me. But that's what I was doing on my 52nd birthday, and basically it means I'm gonna be young forever. That's all I'm saying. Hey. I know, how cool is that? Like, I'm 52, but now I will be young forever. Yes? Any word on uh, another miniseries or season five or movie of Farscape? There is a Farscape script. I think it's a feature-style script. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I know it's in, uh, it, it's in development. I had a text from Rocco Bannon, the creator of Farscape, this morning. Um, he says that my son can be in it. <laughs> so, uh, I, I don't, I, there, there is a script, but it's going to be about money. I mean, really, you know, as I texted back and forth with Rock when I, when I went to see Gar Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, great movie, but I swear the dude stole my underwear and walked her out of them. <laughs> I, w I went to the movie and I was like, this is great. You stole my stuff. <laughs> That's mine. That's my Crichtonism. See, I'm worried. We gotta get Crichtonism out there because I'm afraid it's gonna become a Quinnism. <laughs> or a Star Lordism. Uh, yeah, I mean, I love the movie. I think it's great. Uh, but hopefully, now that maybe somebody realizes that they've actually done at least, you know, the prequel to the Farscape movie, who do the next one. <laughs> I actually think I need to be Star Lord's daddy, you know. Hell yeah! Because at least, you know, morally, philosophically, and artistically, I am Star Lord's daddy. <laughs> yes. Muppets, well, they would take umbrage on that. They don't call themselves Muppets. They call themselves uh, advanced animatronic characters. <laughs> it, it, no, it's awesome. They really, I've said this before, they're, they're better than a lot of actors you work with. Um, well, not a lot, one or two. They're better than one or two actors. No, they're, they're because they're, they're controlled by people. And, it's, and you know, interestingly enough, as we move forward, and, and and Hawking becomes concerned that we're going to you know perish at the hands of AI, which we might. That's a, that's a realistic concern. Uh, you know, 
will actors be replaced with AI? Or will they merely be replaced with puppeteers? This is part of the conversation. Like, you could take my image from any age, and now, you, you know, now it's not gonna be very long to be able to manipulate it. So they could continue Farscape the series, I just wouldn't be paid. You know, they just, <laughs> hey look, there's John Crichton, he's, and he's young again. Oh, he's gorgeous. <laughs> That's what my wife said. Uh, <laughs> you know, so that, uh, but ultimately, the puppets are not an AI. They're acted, and they're acted by people with their hands, you know, and their, their emotions, and they're interpreted. So that it's a human being that you're working with. They just have, they're an extension of the human being. So it's exactly like working with an actor, except for the fact that there's five of them on the floor and you just don't look at them. You look. You look at Rigel in the eye, not Johnny Eccleston in the eye. You know, otherwise it looks like you're looking at the puppet's crotch and then he gets a hold of the Like, ooh, what's Crichton looking at? <laughs> you gotta be careful of that on t-shirts. Do you guys have that? Like, when you walk around a con and you're like really into people's t-shirts? Be careful, guys, with looking at the girls' t-shirts. That's what I'm saying. I meet people and the first thing I want to do is look at their t-shirt, right? Because, you know, I'm wearing my t-shirt. But I, I want to look at people's t-shirts because I like all the, most, well not all the things you guys like because there was a dude in a furry outfit here, but <laughs> <laughs> I only hear stories, I've never participated, but it might be a fun way for me to go to a con one day, <laughs> just show up, see the whole furry scene, see what it's about, see if it's true, is it true what they say about furries, you know what I mean? It's like one of those myths. You guys understand this. If I walked out on the street and started talking to somebody about furries, you know, they wouldn't understand what I'm talking about. It's a Crichtonism, but right here. Yeah, man, you know, walking around like a furry, figured out. That'd be awesome. Could be scary. Might see things I don't want to see. They have flaps. You get lights on. Oh, okay, the question over here. Yes. Wow. If I could drink with any character in any TV series? Holy moly. Well, see, now you immediately you're going like Trisha Helfer or something like that, but that's a whole different drinking. Oh. <laughs> that's a different kind of drinking. Oh, wow. I, you know, you, you kind of maybe want to drink with one of the doctors. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to go with that. I'm, I think, actually, Chris Eccleson's doctor on a bender <laughs> in time. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? Because first, you, first you'd start drinking, and then you'd get in a TARDIS, and you'd be, like, flying a TARDIS while, there's like, DUI? <laughs> DU time TI? DU TTI. Sorry, you were driving under the time, uh, time travel influence. Oh. I have to get the acronym right on that, but yeah. What if there's a Time Lord edict about not flying and time traveling while drunk? <laughs> how, did they, how did they pull me over? The sirens. <laughs> yeah, they got it. There's, there's the, there's the, there's, first there's the TARDIS, and then like a bigger TARDIS comes along. It's an NSA TARDIS. <laughs> it's not a police box, it's a, it's a CIA box. No. What you're really asking, because of the imprecise nature of the human language again, is you're asking, how did I end up working on Doctor Who? Yeah, flying drunk in a TARDIS. Oh, you're being literal! Yeah. Wow! How would they you over? Yeah, so the CSA would have their own TARDIS. The NSA. KGB TARDIS. <laughs> Police box, man. Like, seriously, you know, they're gonna, like, they will remember the police box. Only they won't call it a police box, it'll be a TARDIS. 300 years from now, the word TARDIS will still live in the English language and police box will be gone. <laughs> Next question. The, how did it feel to replace Richard Dean Anderson question? Yeah, the one, I, I tiptoed very gingerly around that question. 
for years and years. It felt great, man. <laughs> they were so happy to have me and have him gone. It's like, oh, thank God, Browder showed up. <laughs> The first day on set, Chris Judge is going, so how does it feel to be on a real TV show? Oh. Yeah, uh, you know, that's reasonable. They spend more money than we did. <laughs> and we had real guns. Uh, so these are real guns, except for that thing you're carrying, dude. <laughs> what is that, a worm? <laughs> Uh, it was fun. It was a great cast. I had a great time with those guys. It was a really, it was a really good working group. They obviously knew what they were all about at SG1 because they'd been doing it for 400 years before I got there. <laughs> Back when they were naming America, SG1 was still going on. Um, and so I came into a very well-oiled machine. But it was, it was great fun working with them. Mike's a really hard worker. Chris is a lot of fun. Amanda's fabulous. And then I got Claudia. You know, well, Claudia came along. Uh, for, for the ride, I, I followed her there. Um, so it was great. Yeah, it was good fun. I don't know. What, what do you think it'd be like? How'd you like to replace Richard Dean Anderson? <laughs> you could do it, dude. I, I think the leader of SG1 needed a beard. You know what I mean? More manly sort of thing. Less of that sort of, you know, because if you had a beard, that would really say special ops, wouldn't it? You know what I mean? The Air Force was... You know, <laughs> Yeah, because special ops, they kind of do their own thing, right? The Air Force would always want to rein us in a little bit, but now that I know more about the military, and I want to think of myself as special ops, yeah, I should have had a beard. That would have, then they'd have known the difference between me and Michael Shanks. Oh, wait, he had the beard. <laughs> See, you guys get this stuff. You understand what I'm talking about. When I talk at home, no one understands. Or at least they don't listen. <laughs> this is an unnatural occurrence. You understand that? To stand in front of a group of people and have them not only listen but understand? It's not right. It's, it's awesome. I'm gonna go like, like a, yes, you. Did you come up with the uh, finest saying on SG1? We finally got the band back together. Huh? No, I did not. That was uh, that, that was that was uh, Robert. Robert Cooper. Rob Cooper came up with that, and I was fine with it because it's a Blues Brothers reference, and you know, so I, I'm, I'm all about my pop culture, you know. Where is that pop, see? When we talk about pop culture, we know immediately it's popular culture. English language again, right? Yeah, but, and those, that, that's the, yeah, no, but that's one of those things that resonates with, with people like me that really dig the Blues Brothers, you know what I mean? I just wish we had actually played music. That would have been cool. <laughs> I'd have been on the tambourine. <laughs> uh, in the back with the eye patch. In a furry outfit. <laughs> but I'd have to be a furry, so now I, you know, now I'm limited. I'm either doing Chewbacca, which means I'm actually in costume. Oh, no, I wouldn't have to be a friend. I could actually be a stormtrooper. Uh, what character would I go as? See, originally I would have said, you know, I would, I would go as Kirk. But I've done that on screen, so I can't. Did that in SG-1 200th episode, so they, they, you know, that would be a not anonymous anymore. Ooh. Would I go as anything? <laughs> the Easter Bunny. <laughs> so I'm telling you that Easter Bunny thing is powerful. It's fertile. It's manly. You know, I'm all about I'm all about people who uh, you know come to your house and leave you stuff. <laughs> Santa Claus would be good. That would be fun. Come to like, is there a Santa Claus out there? Yeah. Oh, good. Is he giving a Jedi Santa? Is he giving away stuff? No, no, because you guys have all been bad. That's why. <laughs> You got a cookie, but no one else did. <laughs> of what? The kids need to read program. Oh. Okay, good. So they're giving them some. They're giving them some Heinlein. Yeah, a little bit of Asimov. Some Stephen R. Donaldson. Well, you know, I mean, I forced my children to. I forced my children to read. 
They were they were they were they were chained to the, the reed reed boom boom boom. <laughs> they're they're both pretty precocious. Um, I would I think I'd start them off on I'd start the boys off on Ender's Game. I think that's where I'd start the boys and I'd the, no not Ender's Game. Boys love Ender's Game. The Hobbit's hard to read. Have you read it? <laughs> Try reading it aloud to your kids. That's really hard. It's like, does a man know where a period's supposed to go? <laughs> I know it's a full stop in England. English language again. But, you know, use the full stop, Mr. Tolkien. Come on. And what's with this whole Elvish stuff? How do I pronounce that? It's like the Chippewa language or something. Way too many consonants. Um, okay, well, you could start with The Hobbit. I, 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 I like I like Ender's Game. My boy read Ender's Game when he was about 10. And, and or, you know, Harry Potter, obviously. My daughter started on Harry Potter when she was like three or something. <laughs> and grew up with Harry Potter. She thinks she is Hermione still. <laughs> it's kind of scary when your college-age girl comes around and goes, Levioso. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Have you, has anybody seen Boyhood? The movie Boyhood? All right, uh, it, it's uh, uh, made by the same guy that did Dazed and Confused. You seen that? That's right, Linkletter. Um, you should see Boyhood because there's this really wonderful moment where the kids are dressed as Harry Potter characters going to the, the book sign to get the book. Where the kids lined up to get that book. I think that was a great book for this generation to get started in books. So that's great, passing out books. I love that. Yes, in the back, next question. <laughs> my dream role is usually like has a check with it you know <laughs> so, but someone seriously you get this question all the time they go so uh why did you take uh, the job on farscape <laughs> because they paid me <laughs> um you know, I really, you know, I've tried to answer this question in, in over years and I always answer it dishonestly. <laughs> or rather, my mind changes about stuff. I, I would love to play John Crichton. Again. You know, I've had enough time. I know, really, I mean, that's, a, that's, an honest, that's as honest as I get about this kind of stuff. But it, I, I think the, the worst thing I see in... The worst thing I see in any actor, and I've seen it, but the worst thing I see is in any actor is when they show up for a job and they're just there for the paycheck. And they're doot, 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 you know, well, now they be. Or just call producer. Um, <laughs> and they're phoning in their performance. They're just there for the check. They don't care. They barely know their lines. They haven't read the script. I go to places and an actor who shall not be named had not read the script at all. Had a big part, not read the script. I don't understand how you do that. I think that when you take a role, you fully invest in it. You may fail, fail gloriously if you're gonna fail. Fail gloriously, do that in everything you do in your life. Dare to fail gloriously. I've said this for years, it was my, my mantra on Farscape was let's fail gloriously. Um, which, I, you know, I kinda, I kinda stole probably from a book. Uh, about, you know, the, the, throw your whole being and your might and your energy, throw your entire, your entirety at, at the things you do in life. If you're going to raise children, raise them, you know. If you're going to, if you're going to be an actor, be an actor. Do your job. Do it, do it fully. Do it wholly. You want to be an accountant? I can grind those numbers, but do it, do it with a passion and good stuff comes back. Not always, because eventually you will fail. We all fail. You know, even presidents fail. <laughs> you know, and, and supposedly these are the best, of, the best amongst us. But, you know, the, a project, wow, a, particularly a project which is so weird like Farscape or, you know, when they went out to do Star Wars, you had to say this is going to fail and fail big. Nobody wanted to pay for this. No one wanted to pay to do this movie. Are you kidding me? Space opera? Well, you know, you know, blah, you know, these things don't work. And you, I heard that when we were in Australia, and we were, the the production element in Australia was Channel Nine, and the the 
The head of the network at Channel 9 who refused to give us a time slot told me that, well, you know, my uh, sci-fi just doesn't work in, in Australia. <laughs> told me to my face, sci-fi does not work in Australia. <laughs> Do you ever hear a thing called Star Wars? You know, Alien, uh, Star Trek. <laughs> it, it, it was, it, you know, so, you know, here was a guy who was, was not even going to try. So he didn't even put the show on air in a decent slot in Australia, where it was made. So the people who worked on it at home, everybody thought they were Willie Loman. Yeah, see, these people know their, they know their theater right there. Uh, they thought it was a guy, they thought that the people went out, to, pretended to go out to work and sat on a park bench and never actually worked anywhere because their families never saw Farscape. It was never on TV until after we finished shooting it. Yeah, and, and yet at the same time, you look at it on paper and you're going to go, oh, yeah, this is going to fail. And there's a, that's the reason I got the job, because no one else would take it. <laughs> but Farscape succeeded because people threw themselves at it. The writers loved it. The people who worked on the show loved it. The creature shop loved it. The guys who carried equipment to and from the set cried when the show was canceled. They did. Big, blokey Australian dudes, all they wanted to do was get to 6 o'clock to drink beer, cried when the TV show that they were lugging equipment on was canceled because they loved it so much, because they went after it passionately. And the reason the show succeeded was not because uh, it was not because of me, it was not because of all of the brilliant writing, it was not because of the brilliant cinematography, or the Henson Company, or the brilliance of Claudia Black, or Anthony Simcoe enduring wearing tentacles, you know, for most of his life. It was because collectively people were passionate and threw themselves at it, so I'm a big believer in failing gloriously, and that's why stuff works. And that's when you're an actor, you want people to throw themselves at their craft, throw themselves at their art. If it stinks and it's terrible, you just kind of take it on the chin and move on. But I'm, I'm a big believer in that particular ethic, and I think it shows in a lot of sci-fi projects, not just Farscape, because people love doing it so much. Yes? Okay, so we both went to the same high school. This girl went to my high school, can you believe this? <laughs> Woo! Go Stang! I have no southern accent. Do you think you have a southern accent? Well, well, you grew up there too. They beat it out of you at Myers Park High School. If you show up with a southern accent at Myers Park High School, that's the Myers. Now, Myers Park High School has that accent. That's what the white people sound like. Except for the ones that were further over around Sedgefield, they sound more like this. Here's the Sedgefield accent, here's the Myers Park accent. Can you hear the difference? I'm from Myers Park, I'm from Sedgefield, and then of course there's, you know, the brothers and sisters, and, you know, but yeah. Okay, I've had that people, and they think I'm crazy. <laughs> it is true, I mean, literally, all you do, you cross, you cross one road, it's called Park Road. As soon as you go across that road, accent changes. <laughs> language changes. I love that about language. Is it Bath, or is it Bath? You know, the English didn't say Bath until the 1800s. So when you hear all these period pieces and you hear that posh English accent, nope! It's supposed to sound Southern. Tamar and Tamar and Tamar creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out brief candle. Life is but a walking shadow poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Yeah! That's some, that's some reasonably good writing done in the way it's supposed to be done, not with that punsy English stuff. <laughs> Having said that, my wife is English and I apologize, honey, you just did with me. Yeah, there's another question. Yeah, you. Have I read what? All of the uh, what? Ender's. 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 Ender. Have I read all of Ender's? No, I read uh, Shadow of the Hegemon. I read uh, uh, Ender's Shadow. I read. Uh, 
I've read, I've read four, four or five of them. I like, I like uh, Ender's Shadow and I like Ender's Game. I like the one with Bean, the features Bean, and I like Ender's, uh, Ender's Game. Those are my two favorite in that bunch. But I've read some other Orson Scott Card. I think he's a really interesting writer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm literate. That's right. Even though I did come from the Sedgefield side and she came from the Miles Park side. That's right, I came from the wrong side of the track. Yes, sir. One of the best scenes of the uh, seasons of Farscape is the one where Crichton goes insane. Uh, one of the things. Well, where... how, how much of that was improvised and how much? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so here's what happened. I got to the end of season one, and and I, and I said to the writers, I said, you know. Crichton's becoming unhinged. <laughs> and they said, no, you can't do that. I said, yeah, I'm doing it. <laughs> I came back in season two, I said, he's, re he's, he's got PTSD. He's messed up. And they said, well, what do you mean he's messed up? I said, look, he's at the other end of the universe. He's been beaten, shot at, chased, tortured. Uh, you know, he is, has to have, a, something has gone wrong with him. He is stressed and he has problems. And then they wrote Crackers Don't Matter, right? Where they wrote these scenes where he's hallucinating Scorpius. And I, and I, went, and I went back to the right. So then I started doing stuff, right? Like I'd be in a scene, I'd go, look, I'm looking at the middle of the scene, stop it. And then I go back to the scene, right? So they're watching the rushes and the day, I said, what the hell is he doing, right? He said, what are you doing? I said, He's imagining Scorpius all the time. He has conversations with Scorpius in his head, right? He's been hallucinating him for months. <laughs> and they went, what? <laughs> Not that. <now>. Okay. <laughs> Look, I'll be in a scene, I'm working with someone and we're like talking about, pilot, we need a, okay. Pilot, we need. <laughs> God bless the writers, how they endured me, I'll never know. <laughs> and so, Danny Kemper, who was running the show, said, no, 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 yes! I got it! And so we, we, we kind of backfilled the story, right? We backfilled the story so that the implant, the Harvey clone, the neural clone, which was the science part of it, got put back into the story, and then we carried that forward. So the writers justified what all the really bad acting I was doing, <laughs> the writers justified. Now, I gotta I got say something at this point, that the way we worked on Farscape is so much more like the way films used to be made. And it's the way that television is made to a certain degree. The further we get in Hollywood to all the visual effects, you literally will go on a set, they will pre-vis effect they will dictate how it is shot. Nothing can change because we've already built the CG, right? Now this is not how Hollywood has made movies and very successful movies for generations, but it's, as it becomes corporate and it's expensive and the CG is the most ex expensive and important item, you get these sterile movies which are completely, everything is done, the actor only has to come in, say the lines, and to a certain degree, it is what has happened on a number of science fiction franchises that you go, what happened? Everything about the CG elements trumped the acting. Why is the original Star Wars so rich in character? Because it's an organic process, the actors bring things to it, things happen on set, oh my gosh, that's a Wookiee. And that's how Farscape worked. If you read things by Billy Wilder, yeah, I read nonfiction too. Billy Wilder talks about he's shooting Sabrina with Audrey Hepburn. Well, when they in Hollywood, they used to come out and they would do a movie, and here's how they did the movie. Yeah, we got an idea, uh, and we're going to do this thing, and let's start writing a script, and uh, we got a train over in Fillmore, we'll use that, and you know there's that waterfall because it's running uh, right now because we had rain, so we'll put that in, we'll put this in, and uh, yeah, go ahead and start working on the script, and we'll start shooting. Billy Wilder was shooting Sabrina, they were halfway through the shoot. And he goes to her on a Friday and says, uh, I need you to have a bad day. He goes, what do you mean you mean have a bad day? He goes, I, I, I don't have any pages to shoot on Monday. <laughs> he hadn't written the second half of the script. He had only gotten up to the point where they had shot. 
right? This is a great classic movie. And it's Audrey Hepburn. He goes, because, and she goes, well, and she's, because he says, if they realize that I've fallen behind in my writing, they're going to fire me. <laughs> but they're not going to fire you. So could you really have a bad day so we can finish the day and the studio doesn't know that I don't have the pages to shoot on Monday? And so she doesn't. She, you know, comes out of her trailer late, she flubs her lines, the day goes long, he writes the next two weeks over the weekend. <laughs> and that's how great movies have been made. And it's how great TV is made. So, with Farscape, like, if I was working for a network, and they started seeing some of the stuff we were doing, that's not to say we didn't make mistakes. We did. And Hollywood has made mistakes in big movies as well. But, that organic process, which is visceral and real and human, and reacting to what's happening. You know, you don't go to the end of the universe and stand there and say, yes, I am Mr. America, named after a merchant that never even did anything. <laughs> and I have all the answers. That wasn't John Crichton, that isn't who any of us would be. John Crichton was the guy who was saying stuff that nobody understood. And if, he, if there weren't effects on him, if he didn't go a little bonkers, and sometimes a lot bonkers, he wouldn't be us. He really wouldn't be. And that doesn't happen unless you have a very brave production company, a very, a very brave network like Sci-Fi was for us. They said, go do it, fellas. Just go make it. We'll see it when it comes out. And you have crazy people like David Kemper and Ricky Manning and, and Rock O'Bannon who are wonderful writers and great directors. So we were very privileged in that sense. We were, they, they kind of let us loose. And that's where that came from. So how much did, it, did I improvise? Some of it. Some of it. But that's, that's actually how it came about. Which I think is really cool. <laughs> and we go back to this side of the room. Yes? So growing up, what were your influences in sci-fi? Oh, you, uh, you limited it to sci-fi. I was like, what are your influences? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm really into Matisse. Uh, you know? I think Ulysses is the greatest book ever written. Uh, I'm, just, I'm trying to sound intelligent right now. You know, I, I really, uh, I think that, uh, you know, that Theodore Roosevelt was an amazing man. You know, when you got him by the balls, their hearts and minds will follow. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt said that. That's where that phrase comes from. T.R. said, somebody else probably said it first, but he's the one that's remembered for it because that's the way it goes. Um, when you got him by the balls, their hearts and minds will follow. Uh, my sci-fi influences were anything and everything that was sci-fi because I watched it. Uh, as far as literature goes, it was, you know, I mean, I, re I read Tolkien, but that was rough for me. It was, it was not enough, there weren't enough periods. <laughs> Too many commas. <laughs> but, I, but I loved Stephen R. Donaldson's books when they came out. And, and I loved, you know, I, I loved the highlight stuff, I loved Dune, I loved all that stuff. Um, as far as, if it was, was sci-fi and it was on TV or in a movie, I would watch it. I had a huge, one of the, my greatest upsets in my life was there was a Jerry Lee, Jerry Lewis movie. And it's, I'm trying to remember now, it's, 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 it's about, it's about a, a guy that goes to the moon and, and I'm trying to remember the name of it now. Way out, way out what, yeah, way, way out, or way, whacked way, way out, right? Way out. Way out. It's a Jerry Lewis science fiction movie, Jerry Lewis science fiction movie. If you haven't seen it, you really need to see it. I didn't get to see it because my dad wanted to watch the football. I know, right? And he's like, so no, and there's only one TV in the house, not like today. I can't stream it. So literally, it was the one time it was on, and I actually watched it about a couple years ago. I watched like half of it and went, I didn't miss anything. <laughs> It was, it was awful, but I watched the first half of it. I streamed it, man. You can get it lined. So, yeah, no, I, I waited. A, I, the first day that Star Wars came out, on the Saturday, I was in for the first showing. I sat through for two consecutive showings. And then I showed up at home, and I got in trouble because I was late. And they didn't have a cell phone to track me down like I tracked my son down in the middle of the night. I told him, he to get his ass home. <laughs> Oh, man. See, here's what's going to happen, right? This is, this is the internet age. I'm telling you a story. My son's going to go to school on Monday. And somebody's going to say to him, I hear you were in trouble on Saturday night. Friday night. I hear, I hear you were out late. Where were you, man? I'm not saying where he was, but I might have done the same thing. 
Me, not me, maybe. Now. Uh, next question. So how did you get part on Doctor Who? Why did Mike and Leslie surprised to see you there? Uh, Doctor Who? Uh, true story. When they began filming <laughs> Doctor Who, the reboot, with, with uh, Russell T. Davies, uh, the one with Chris Eccleston, he sat down the writers, he handed them a box set of Farscape, and said, watch this, this is where we want to go. Or something to that effect. Anyway, he locked the writers in a room, chained them up, you know, fed them kibbles, and, and made them watch Farscape. So, years later, when they were looking for someone that could be authentically American, which we know what that means, right? Now I'm an American, I'm a guy that didn't do anything on a boat thousands of years later, now it's a, it means something to us. But, uh, yeah, so they, that's, that's how that happened. So I got a call, and, and they said, do you want to do Doctor Who? And I was like, uh, let me think about it. Yeah! <laughs> Because my wife's English and she grew up on it and my kids have been weaned on it. And when I told, it was interesting, when I told my kids, right? My, my daughter was in high school at the time, basically a grown person, very smart, bright and brilliant. I, I went to her and I said, so I got a job, I've got to go away for a couple of weeks. But it's a, it's, it's a cool job. And she goes, what is it? I said, what's the coolest show ever? And she starts naming shows, she's naming shows, she's naming shows. And I go, nope, 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 nope. And then... Finally, I, she goes, oh, just tell me. I go, Dr. Who. She goes, Daddy! <laughs> this is a very eloquent, composed, 18-year-old girl. And she, she lost her bottle when she heard I was doing Dr. Who. It, was, it literally, you know, of like all the things that you... Every now and then you get a job that like raises you to a certain stature within a certain group. And for my daughter, at that moment, I had made it. <laughs> yeah, but what, but what a great, I mean, what a great thing that you can actually, like, for your kids, like your teenage kids to be impressed with you. Because, like, on a day-to-day -day basis, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very blessed. I'm very lucky. I'm very, very lucky. Next question. I'll get to you. You're, you're, you're in my eye line. You're next. Yeah. I wonder if you'd ever consider narrating another book No one has asked. No one has asked. Uh, although I met Alan Dean Foster. I met that. I met that. And, and, and he was like, it was really great. I said, I'm sorry how I mangled your book. Uh, he said, oh, I loved it. I went, oh, great, man. Thanks, you know. That's really kind of cool. That's one of the things I kind of geek out about writers. You might have noticed, maybe. I geek out about writers. Uh, yeah, like the great, one of, another one of the great things, I get to like meet people like that. And then occasionally you, you realize that, wow, they've actually watched what you've done. And then you really get, you know, oh, no, man. Oh, no, I love you. Oh, I love you. Oh, you're the best ever, man. So it's, it's a great thing, you know? It's, Scalzi? Yeah, I, I don't know him. If I see him, I'll like approach him. <laughs> like, <laughs> give me running this crowd, run away. Um, no, it's, it's an idea, but you know, I don't know. Yeah, I just haven't been, this just haven't been offered. Maybe, you know, I may, I may not be any good at it, I don't know. I'm only good at standing around looking purdy. That's what I'm looking around looking purdy. That's what I do for my wife. Yeah, I love you, baby. <laughs> no, seriously, man. I did an old man thing. Ah, you're the cutest little girl I've ever seen. <laughs> I got lots of characters I play at home. <laughs> they're all kind of repulsive, but they're mean. <laughs> yes, next question. Yeah, uh, speaking of uh, PTSD, uh, has anything happened with... Uh... No, no, that, that's, no, they're, I don't think anything's happening with that right now. That's the thing. I, I try not to, I generally try not to announce anything. Usually someone else announces it and the internet takes it and runs with it. Like I said, the thing that I'm going to be working on, I got an NDA so I can't announce it. Eventually, maybe they'll announce it, but it is, it's gold. It's but no, as far as I know, nothing's going on with that, as far as I know. But I, I think, look, it's, 
It's a, it's a topic that needs to be addressed. It's an ongoing topic. It's going to continue to be an ongoing topic. No, it is. It's, it's you know, it it and it, it go, dates all the way back to the the beginning of time. The soldiers come home, and sometimes only part of you comes home. And it, it's, I don't, I don't think there's been a definitive film made about that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, coming home, there's 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 good films about it, but but there isn't really one for this generation. They sort of touched on it, they only, but they only touched on it briefly in American Sniper. It's a hard film. It's a hard film to make because it's a, it's a hard subject. It's a very difficult subject to talk about in a population that doesn't even realize they're still at war. You know? You still have military in a war zone. You have soldiers and young people going over there and, and being subjected to, to shell shock or whatever it is you want to call it, they call it something else in every generation. You know, you know that, that, that uh, it's, it's a hard one. It's a hard film to make. And someone should make a good one about it because film is probably, film tells us more about what's going on than, than the latest slogan or the latest soundbite or the latest YouTube video because these YouTube videos last for 15 seconds. I mean, we've been dealing with race in this country my entire lifetime. I remember seeing signs, color only. I was in one of the I was in the first desegregated school system in the country, Charlotte, North Carolina. By you know Mecklenburg County, we were desegregated. We had race riots. We had problems. We dealt with all that, and we're still dealing with it. And the Twitter feed and the latest flare up of these things is not going to be the answer. We need to look at it deeper. And within our culture, sometimes film is a better way to. To, to get it in there, but like I say, it's a tough one to make because it's not necessarily a commercially viable kind of thing, you know. Yes? Um, one thing I loved about John Franklin was his sarcasm, and I noticed in the later years, he became uh, much more sarcastic and a lot more pop culture references. Did you have any influence? Uh, I don't think that his pop culture references increased. Uh, his sarcasm came out of I, I think a, 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 a harder edge. He became harder edge as he went along. Um, and it, it may have been that, you know, he certainly had more irony in, in him as he went along, which Americans have trouble with, irony being difficult for us. <laughs> We're very literal people. It's like our language. We go back to our language again. You know, Americans have this thing of, you know, combining words to describe things. An aubergine is an eggplant, right? We're literal. We're really a kind of literal people. We we lose certain subtleties, and the irony is one of them that thrives much more in in other forms of the English language. Uh, but yeah, he, he became he became a little harder edged and a little more desperate as time went on because the, the stakes continued to rise for him. But you know, I, I you know I think if we see him. It'll be interesting to see what he's doing now. I'm really curious about what he's doing now. You know, he's he's on Tatooine. <laughs> My people, Dagobah. <laughs> exactly, that was John Crichton's problem. Nobody knew what Dagobah was, right? Yeah, Yoda from Dagobah. Uh, <laughs> My people. Yes? Uh, so I was just wondering, for Farscape, what was like your favorite episode of filming? Like, is there a story involved with that? Oh, uh, dude, I mean, have you seen the show? <laughs> okay, so... For you, what do you think your favorite episode would be? Like, the crackers don't matter? Crackers don't matter, just because it was so zany and weird. I had a great time making that episode. Yeah, I think it's just so much fun. Yeah, it's just like you can see the whole thing and you're just like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, that was 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 cool. Yeah, that those of you who missed Meltdown, it was like one long makeout session. <laughs> I don't know what the writers were thinking of. They were like, okay, so we're going to do this thing, and you guys are going to be like hands all over each other, kissing each other. You can't keep your hands off each other. And I'm like, dude, man, this is going to be a hard one to sell at home. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I haven't, haven't rewatched it, but I, I probably ought to <laughs> once my wife gets rid of me. <laughs> yes, next question. Yes, you. In the glasses, you saw. Um, so, um, between the job training and the community, which one do you use to the 
I love young people. <laughs> because I wanted to ask, which one do you choose to be with? <laughs> and when I know that John Barrowman had a different answer. <laughs> Honestly, it's such an English... The doctor is... I don't think I would make a good doctor. I can do the crazy stuff, and stuff but if they ever get like a really staid and boring doctor, I think I'd make a great companion. I think I would totally make a great companion, man, you know? And a number of those doctors would really be attractive to me. Um, yeah, no, and I had this discussion. I was really, you know, after I went on the show, I was like, you know, you guys, it's about time to turn over companions, isn't it? Don't you think you need, like, like bring in an American companion just for a while? Just for a while, so that way, you, that way all of the Americans in the audience can dream of being the Doctor's companion. Because the Doctor in Doctor Who will never be anything other than British. Ever. It's just not going to happen. He is a British institution. That'd be like, you know, Captain Kirk. Wait, a captain of the Enterprise that's British? Oh. <laughs> My people! But the British hang to their own. They cling to their own, you know? That's actually what I found coming out of drama school. I went to drama school in England. I'm very, very cultured. Even if I can't remember things. <laughs> but when I came out of drama school in England, and I, and I, what happens in drama school in England? I went for this three-year program. All you do is act and read and do Shakespeare and, and, you know, hang out with a bunch of people in the pub and smoke cigarettes and drink beer. <laughs> they don't do that anymore, but they did back in those days. So, yeah, there I was in the pub, but uh, the, the final year of drama school, they put, you put on plays. So you're putting on the play, and the agents come, right? So I have, you have, and it's a big deal because you're doing theater, I, and I was doing it. I did a play, it was in the round, and I was naked for about a scene. <laughs> so you can't really hide, but I was butt naked <laughs> in the theater, in the round, and uh, I started getting calls from agents. <laughs> No, that's not true. <laughs> no, 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 I was actually, I, I'd done a play and I was, um, I was, uh, you know, and I was working in England, so I was using received pronunciation, I was being English. And I would get phone calls, or you get a letter, you go to your box and there would be a letter, and it's the letter from the agent. And, and you look at the letter and you go, oh, wow, the agent wants me to call them. So now this is a big deal for a young actor to get an agent means it's an entry into the business. Not enough to be in drama school, you've got to get someone to get you some work, right? Because the idea is to have a job and get paid. Uh, so you, I got letters. And I got a letter and I'd been playing an English role in an English play, I'd been training with RC pronunciation. It was a classical piece and the agents would write and they would say, please give us a call at zero two blah 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 blah. See, that's the, Lon that's the London prefix back in the day, zero two. And I called them. And they, I would say, hi, this is Ben Browder, uh, Central School of Speech and Drama, I got a letter from you. And they'd say, uh, what? <laughs> Hang on a second. Yeah, you, uh, you, came to, you came to my performance uh, and you sent me a letter saying you'd like to discuss representation. I just wanted to follow up. And they go, where, you're, where, where, which school are you at? I go, at Central School of Speech and Drama, now known as the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama. You know, I was in that play with Rufus Sewell, you saw me, blah, 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 you know. <laughs> and well, what happened is that they would, they would get confused. And then we'd tell, and at a certain point they go, you're American. I go, well, yeah. And they said, well, we can't do anything for you. And I said, what? I, I said, no, no, no. Like, I'm married to an English girl. I've got the right to work here. I'm actually already in British equity. And they go, yeah, but you're American. And I go, what? They go, but you saw me in a play and I was doing English, right? And you didn't know I was an American, so I can play English. And they said, no, you're an American. <laughs> Literally would not take me on as a client because I was an American and an American could not play an Englishman. So the doctor will never be anything but British and I plan to be the companion. <laughs> Well, Ben, we're at five minutes. That we're starting in five minutes? I know I came early, but... <laughs> we're unfortunately at the end in five minutes. Why? Well, it's your schedule. No, I mean, who's, who's on after? Who's on, who's on second? Uh, What's on second? I don't know. Third base.
Do you have uh, photo ops or do you have? Uh, I probably have. Do I have photo ops? Yeah, I don't want to. Autographs. I have autographs. Yeah, so well, like anybody wants an autograph is sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> now there's an idea. Do the signing while doing the thing. Oh yeah. So that, you know, when you ask this question, you get to ask a question and you sign an autograph. We can take it, unless there's someone immediately on after me, I'm having way too much fun. Unless, if you guys need to go. No! no. All right, then stand up for a second. Get your legs running. You know, we don't have to sit on this. Don't, I mean, if your butt's tired and itchy, just, this is a seventh inning stretch. Yeah. Just, really, Al, we're going to be teaching aerobics in here later. This is the portion where the kids can go to, uh, the, kid, the kids will go to the, the preschool function. <laughs> now, you know how they have it in churches where the kids come from the beginning and then they leave and then they really talk about God? <laughs> yeah, if you need to take the kids out, that's all good and fine. We're going to, we're, we're, we're <laughs> we have people that can teach them about other things. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'm going to make another sweep of the room. Sure. On questions, if there's any more questions, otherwise we will wrap it well, up. I actually have a question for you. Today. Oh, you want a question? I do, if you, if you don't mind. Did it says you, that says you, did, you did this one. yesterday. He's like, okay, so I'm going to be helping you with your panel. Yeah, he's like, like, go ahead. Take well, it. What are you going to do? <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Stand here and look pretty. <laughs> well, I was curious because I watched a little film called Bad Kids Go to Hell. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody seen this? You, you're, then you have a treat in store for you. You're lucky. Yeah, but uh, I believe there's a sequel coming, and you are uh, heavily involved in the sequel. Is it something you'd like to talk about, maybe? Okay, so I did a, I did a, a small part in a, in a movie called Bad Kids Go to Hell, T.O., right? And they decided they wanted to do another one, uh, and they asked me if I would come on board, and I was like, well, you know, I kind of did the first one, I'm not sure. And, they, and then they asked me, do you want to direct? Yeah, okay, I'll do that. So, um, I directed for the first time in my life this summer. Yeah. And I still don't, I have no idea how it's going to turn out yet. I've seen, we, we got, we, we've just finished the first assembly in post. But, yeah, I got, I, got to, I got to direct and I had the best time since I worked on Farscape. Yeah. It was awesome. It was it was ridiculous amount of fun. I got to sit on the other side and cast these young people. I got a cast. I got a, I got a great young cast. So it's set, in a, it's set in a high school. Bad kids go to hell, but with a two instead of the T-O. So it's a sequel, but it's like a reboot because it's not anything like the first movie other than the fact that it's a body count movie and people are going to die in horrible ways. You just don't know who. It's basically, as I said, it's Agatha Christie but in a private high school where there's like rich kids so you want them to die. <laughs> but it also means that you get to get the rich girls in their like little schoolgirl outfits, which is complete con fodder, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, you know, you see that all the time. So, you know, we'll have one with a welding mask on and their little outfit. So uh, we, we, we shot this movie and I got a cast. So we got to do the casting and I got a cast of almost all 18-year-olds. There's no 20-year-olds playing 18, they're really 18 years old. So I cast a number of them in Dallas, got a couple out of LA. And uh, who else is in the movie? Uh, Sean Astin is in the movie. Yeah, uh, Sufi Bradshaw's in the movie. Uh, Gina Gershon is in the movie. Uh, Sammy Hanratty plays uh, the lead in the movie. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so it's a pretty it's a pretty interesting group of people. I I I got some I got some fun stuff and uh, we had a great time shooting it. It was pure chaos and pure joy at the same time. Uh, I don't know how the project's going to turn out. I'm not re I, I'm not responsible because again, like these things, there's thousands of moving parts and thousands of people going on. But I did have an incredibly awesome time working with these young actors and. Going, yeah, let's put the camera here, right? Oh, awesome, okay, now we're gonna do this. All right, yeah, now I want blood over here. Yeah, that's great. Oh, no, more goo, more goo. I do have one very gooey scene. So, and the Farscape people will appreciate that. They're like, oh, that's gross. Awesome. 
Yeah, so I directed that, uh, and we're in post, and we've got to add our, some of our CG elements and put some funky music on it and tighten it up, and it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. I, I highly recommend that you direct a movie. It's so choice. <laughs> if you have the means, you must direct one. <laughs> Ferris Bueller's Day Off, right? Yeah, yeah. My people. Look at you shaking your head over there. No, no, man. I should we, should we tell the should we tell the, the story? You, you know you want to tell the story that we had today, right? Which one? We're talking about a Hawking 50 caliber, right? We're talking about a, a Hawking 50. This is really it's not appropriate, but his timing on it was so good. So I'm going, you know, and he's saying, I, I want, you know, would you like a Hawking 50 caliber? I go, yeah, but I don't know what to do. My wife's a pacifist. And what would I do with it in LA? Because if I shoot something, rule in my house growing up, you shoot it, you eat it. Okay. So he's been in Iraq for like, you know, the last 10 years on and off, and his whole experience with guns. So I'm talking about you shoot it, you eat it. And he goes, Yeah, man, I've been in Iraq, and you can't eat an Arab. <laughs> wrong but so choice the timing on it was impeccable I just I had never thought about it I mean it was like because literally I thought you shoot it you eat it I never thought about it in terms of like that side of things <laughs> you know I'm picturing I'm out there and I'm gonna you know I'm gonna I'm gonna eat the squirrel because that happens first time my wife went up to the mountains of Tennessee and my dad walked out of the woods with a brace of squirrels in one hand and a shotgun in the other no, I am not joking. This is for reals. My dad came out of the My dad was an educated man, but he was a country boy. He comes out of the woods wearing overalls. He's got his, he's got his 12 gauge double barrel in one hand and six squirrels in the other. And he comes into the kitchen with the vermin and he puts them on the counter and there's dinner. Like, no, if you shoot it, you eat it. I can't be <laughs> <laughs> you're right, man. You're right. I was, I was wrong. I now have to amend my rule as if you shoot it, you eat it. I'm like, wow, I had never even thought about that side of it. Which goes to show you how naive and, um, you know, there's people out there that have, you know, like real stuff, you know, because everything I shot at eight except for that, that, that rat. <laughs> and a woodchuck. I won't eat a woodchuck. Woodchuck. You know where that comes from? That, that's what the Indians had called it a longer name with Wuchaka in it, right? And it was like a Wuchaka, and then we anglicized it to Woodchuck. That's what we do. We two words, simple Woodchuck, but did a Woodchuck ever chuck wood? No. That's why, that's why that makes no sense. What does that giant varmint have to do? You see, a Woodchuck is like a giant rat. What does that have to do? like a mutated beaver with no, no flappy tail. Why is that a Woodchuck? That makes no sense. The English language. You know, I thought maybe Slade named after a dude named Chuck, you know. Another sci-fi reference right there, right? The whole show about that wood Chuck. <laughs> would Chuck go? I don't know. Next question, yes. Uh, you have shot the stuff in Australia. But I didn't eat it all. <laughs> I did not eat any Australians, right? I'm saying I shot, Australia. I shot Australians, but I didn't eat them. And these kids that I shot this summer, I didn't eat them either. So, you know. In Australia, what's the advantage? Great surf. <laughs> See, she thinks I'm not sensitive. Really, the only advantage in Australia is great surf, beautiful women, beer. Uh, <laughs> the exchange rate can help, <laughs> but not right now. So, you know, okay. um, the advantage to shooting in Australia from a creative standpoint, at the time that we shot in Australia, don't know what it's like now, may have changed, is that the Australians are used to dealing with budgets that are usually pretty tiny. Star Wars hadn't come in yet, they had done Matrix, uh, they hadn't done Moulin Rouge. So that you're talking about an industry which is very adept at making a dollar go a long way. They're very creative, they're very adventurous, it's an egalitarian society. So the advantage of shooting there is, 
you can get bang for your buck, and you also got a creative energy that you can't get with a bunch of union guys standing around going, don't touch that, that's my job, right? Because the film industry can be like that. The film industry can literally be like, you know, you be on the set and someone, you know, you need to move the chair like three inches, and so you start to move the chair, and no, somebody, that's somebody's job. They look, don't, 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 don't touch that chair, I got it. And they, they go move and move the chair. Australia doesn't have that going on. So, so like, if we were doing a scene with Rigel, there wasn't like a puppeteer's union that said, I can't help with Rigel. So there's literally scenes where I'm working with Rigel where I'm in close proximity, right? And I got my hands on him, right? But the puppeteer can't get around that, so I'm actually doing Rigel's hand while strangling him and talking to him and <laughs> puppeteering Rigel's little three-finger hand, right? So I, I actually, I'm responsible for Rigel's brilliant hand acting. <laughs> It's the reason he's a little fey at times. <laughs> or otherwise strong. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great place to work. Next question. So with the exception of your role in The Killer with Ed, you seem to usually play military type or someone with a gun. Yes. Is that something that you do or type Obviously, you know, having grown up in the South, uh, in that culture, uh, I'm comfortable with a weapon in my hand. The very dangerous things, but uh, I come out of the tradition where you learn about weapons, you learn about guns, you learn their purposes and meaning from your father, your grandfather, your uncles, and anyone who was older than you. That, that you, um, you knew how to, the first thing they did was they'd bring the weapon in and they would let you clean it. Then the next thing they did is they would let you carry the weapon. And then they would finally let you shoot their weapon. And by the time you were 11, you got your own gun. <laughs> but by that time, you had been around gun safety for over like a decade. You'd been around gun safety, you know? Uh, so I'm comfortable around weapons. So I don't know, maybe it's, I really should carry a gun into every audition I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's just harder to get guns through like, you know, security these days. <laughs> I actually did have trouble getting through security when I carried Winona across the border. No, yeah, no, I came to do a TV show and I carried a, a pulse pistol in my bag. And I'm coming through security, right? You know, not, not on the plane, but actually literally coming through customs, right? And these dudes like pulled me out of line and like strip, you know, did strip search me, but almost. And it was because I had I had a pulse pistol in my bag, so it's hard to it's hard it's even hard to travel with prop weapons. And, and these days, when I started in Hollywood, they used to search your car, your bags on the way off a lot because they didn't want you to steal computers and scripts. These days, they search you on the way into the lot. That's what happened. 9/11. What changed was they they used to be worried about what you were going to steal. Now they're worried about what you're going to bring in. Uh, and it may be a reasonable worry, but I don't think it's as reasonable as we make it out to be. We're vulnerable in a lot of ways in a lot of places. But I don't really get why the NSA feels that I shouldn't be able to, de to, to disable the GPS on my phone. You realize that prior to 2004, you could, you could disable the GPS on your phone, right? The phone tracks you everywhere you go. They can have a record of you no matter where you go. And then during the worries that we have, when they got us, when every day it's an amber alert, where every day there's an orange, you know, you go, the, we're at DEFCON 2, you know, and you hear it in the airport, and every day you get tense, you get tense, you get tense. They, in a healthcare bill, they, for the purposes of facilitating 911 calls so that if you had a problem and you needed to call 911, they could find you, they, eliminated the ability of the consumer to take the GPS tracking off of their phone in a healthcare bill. Sneaky. You know what I mean? Now, I'm not saying there's anything nefarious going on or that they're listening right now or that they can listen through my phone. I'm not that paranoid, but I'm pretty close. <laughs> I am Southern after all, and we were invaded. <laughs> Northern aggression. There's stories that were passed down from generation and had not in Myers Park, of course. <laughs> Myers Park is a bunch of carpetbaggers. <laughs> they cooperated with the Union Army. That's why they got the money today. 
But the poor people of the South, and it really doesn't matter whether it's true or not true, the, the myth of it is what endures. See, it doesn't really matter whether Crichton was ever a writer or a person, that someday a Crichtonism will be like the greatest act a man can perform. <laughs> it's like doing the dishes or changing a diaper. Did you do a Crichtonism today? Yes, I did. What does that mean? I don't know. Where's it from? I don't know, but it's a Crichtonism. That's awesome. Love the English language. But yeah, the myths of the South pervaded the culture that I grew up in. I used to hear stuff, I'm like, really? 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 And then I found out that the county that I come from, first off, it's real near Shiloh. So if you know anything about the, the Civil War, you know what a mess that is, right? So it's real near Shiloh, and I had a great, great, great grandfather that fought in the Battle of Shiloh. He was in the he was in the Fourth Tennessee Infantry. There was also a Fourth Tennessee Tennessee uh, Cavalry, which was in the same county, and it was a Union. It was a Union unit. They had a Union Cavalry, Fourth Tennessee, and the Fourth Infantry was on the other side. So the east and west side of the county, down in down on the Alabama border in Tennessee, Mississippi border near Corinth, half the county was Union and half the county was Confederate. They were literally fighting each other, neighbors fighting each other, in the middle of the South. But anyway, diverse from the story, my great-great-great-grandfather was listed as killed at the Battle of Shiloh. So, you know, there's lots of stories and myths about, you know, the sacrifices made, he was fighting for the Confederacy in Shiloh, and I start doing the records, I dig in the records, and then I look and realize that, but my great-great-great-grandfather, the one that came after him, was born in 19... He was born in 1864. <laughs> Shiloh was 15 miles from the house. He literally ran away from the battle, was listed as killed in action. No, he literally was deserted from the Southern Army. I come from a long line of cowards. <laughs> the military history. What? It's strategic I know, but I'm thinking, he literally, I can see him right now. He was a scout in the infantry. I can see him. He's like creeping up there through the woods with his, with his honking 50 cow, right? You know what I mean? And he's looking at this, and he sees the steamboat come down the Mississippi with all the Union soldiers, and he goes, I got cotton to plant. <laughs> I'm going to get back to my wife and my slave and get it in. And it was, it was literally one of those things where, you know, you look at these things, and you go, so what's the truth of this? I was told all these stories about the North and the war of Northern aggression growing up. Much like I was told that, uh, you know, that... <laughs> I was told that the Pilgrim Fathers, you know, saved themselves when, really, have you heard this? I think I told this earlier, but I gotta tell this one, because this also was my epiphany in the middle of the night. I don't even know if I talked about it yet. So, there, we, there I am reading about, I'm reading a history lesson. It's not Sunday, so I can do history instead of theology. Um, yeah, come to a Sunday meeting, we'll, we'll get theological and spiritual. Uh, yeah, no, I was reading about the, I was reading, as, you know, in, in the middle of my epiphany about Crichtonisms, I'm reading about truth and everything else. So the pilgrims show up at Plymouth Rock. Well, no, it wasn't Plymouth Rock because that story was written a hundred years later by a woman in Devon who had never been to the United States. She actually saw something about the Pilgrim Festival, the Pilgrim Feast, celebrated, that was written in a Boston paper, so this whole story was not even written until like a hundred years later, and it was written by a woman in England who had never been to America to begin with. So the pilgrims show up, there's a hundred of them, about six months later half of them are dead and the other half are children. How are they going to survive on the land? They didn't have any guns, they didn't have a plow, they didn't have a fishing line. They're in the wilderness and it's a bunch of merchants and bankers and non-agrarian people trying to live in the wilderness. They're separatists, they weren't Puritans, they were separatists. So they're starving in the wilderness and they get saved. They get saved because they're able to speak to someone who's a Native American. The Native American happened to be an Algonquin Indian. Now, uh, if, you know, if you know anything about that language, which I didn't until I read about it, it's impronounceable. I read every word I read, it's got all these consonants strung together. You can't say, you can't say anything in Algonquin, right? So they obviously weren't speaking the, the native language. It was a native speaker that came to them and saved them. Basically, he knew enough English to communicate with them. And you're thinking, well, wait a minute, aren't the pilgrims the first one to land on Plymouth Rock? We're you know, there weren't any other else around, right? No, this guy, this guy had been captured by a bunch of fishermen, 
<laughs> 20 years before, had been hauled back to Europe and been made a slave. He had been a slave in Spain and he escaped. And they captured him again, he was a, a slave in France. 15 years he's a slave in Europe. They haul him back, he escapes. He escapes back, manages to get back to where his tribe used to be. They've all died of smallpox. He joins this other tribe, becomes the chief of the tribe. And now these white people show up on the shores and they're starving to death. They can't plant, they can't hunt, can't fish. The guy who was enslaved by the Europeans knows enough English to communicate with them and teach them how to survive on the land. Wow. <laughs> So, you know, I, I mean, you think about these stories and about what is really going to be remembered. And you think about, what was I taught in grade school? All I know is that the force is with you. <laughs> and that's what they're going to remember. Well, I'm afraid all good things that's must come it. to an end. So you get us an extra half hour. Shut me down. Thank you for coming. It's a great time. I appreciate you guys. Here.